Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, indeed my pleasure and honor to have this opportunity to attend this uh, uh, conference. I really appreciate for the uh, invitations of uh, the Hosting Institute, the UC Berkeley, uh, IAS, and the uh, IPSAS uh, invitation. Really appreciate. And uh, I think in this uh, uh, session, I think it's a very important uh, topic we are going to uh, discuss. Uh, I think in the, um, I think during the past few years, I think I, maybe I should say many years, I think cross-trade relationship is uh, always is a very uh, complicated issue and uh, take a lot of energy and energy and uh, a lot of times to discuss. So uh, I think in this session, uh, we are very happy to uh, invite uh, uh, quite a few um, uh, presenters and the discussants, that they are experts on this uh, uh, important issue and to uh, make uh, insightful observations about this uh, topic. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, the paper uh, presenters. Uh, the paper presenters of the first uh, paper uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Yu Shan Wu. Uh, Dr. Wu is uh, uh, director of the Institute of uh, Apartheid Science, Academic Senate. And he is also the distinguished uh, research fellow of this uh, institute. And, and uh, um, the uh, paper presenters of this uh, paper, another one is uh, the Professor Ditmo, and he's a very uh, well-known scholar uh, in this area. I think many of you probably have known him already. And he is the professor of the Department of Particle Science at UC Berkeley. And the, the paper presenters of the uh, second paper is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Zhe Gang Len, uh, Professor Len. Uh, he is the professor of uh, uh, the uh, Department of Political Science, uh, National Zhengzhou University. And he is also the research fellow of the Institute of Political Science, uh, Academic Seneca. And the uh, third uh, paper uh, presenter uh, is um, uh, Professor Gang Ling. And Professor Lin, uh, he is uh, the uh, professor of the School of International and Public Affairs, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And the presenter of the fourth paper is the uh, Dr. Tom Scott. And the Dr. Gord is the professor of the Department of Sociology at the UC uh, Berkeley. And we have uh, two paper uh, discussions in this panel. And the first one is uh, uh, Professor uh, Xu Si. Uh, Dr. Xu Si, uh, Su, uh, Xu, uh, Dr. Xu, uh, Xu Sijian, and he is the professor of the uh, uh, Institute of Particle Science, Academic Seneca, and he is also a very uh, well-known uh, scholar on this uh, issue. Uh, thanks for Professor Xu. And the second paper presenter is uh, Tong Zheng Yuan, and Professor Tong is uh, a professor of the Graduate Institute of uh, the Development Studies, uh, National uh, Zhengzhi University. Um, okay, and uh, um, uh, probably you have known the uh, rules of this panel already, but I would like to briefly uh, 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 maybe repeat the rule. For every uh, paper presenters, uh, you have uh, 70 minutes to present the paper, and uh, a bear will rinse the once at uh, uh, 16 minutes and twice at uh, 17 minutes. And for uh, each discussion, uh, you have uh, 15 minutes to give comments uh, on two specific uh, papers. And the bell will rinse the once at 14 minutes and twice at 15 minutes. Okay, uh, now I, may I invite the first uh, paper pre pre presenter, uh, Dr. Ditmo, to present your paper. Thank you. This is very much a joint effort, but uh, uh, Professor Wu has graciously allowed me to present the paper, and he will answer all the questions, if you have any questions <laughs> about the paper, because uh, he has all the... Uh, this is a, another look at the cross-strait relationship from a macro-political perspective, and we take three different uh, tacks on the issue. Uh, domestic political competition, uh, Taiwan's globalization, and uh, third, uh, strategic triangle. 
So let me go through each of these in greater detail. Uh, first, domestic political competition. We think that in all three actors, we choose these three actors obviously because they're very much integrally related to each other, integrally tied politically to each other. Uh, the United States is the only country that will support uh, Taiwan and China is the only country that has a uh, very strong threat to Taiwan a, a national, uh, national, uh, in terms of national interest. Taiwan is intrinsically tied to these three countries, so they make up a natural triangle very, very clearly. Uh, the failure on, 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 the, on the mainland domestic politics, uh, it's harder to get at because there isn't a clear uh, index for political machinations on the mainland. It's elite politics. But we have discovered through our own independent research in other areas that there is a cycle, a political cycle on the mainland, and that it coincides roughly with the five-year uh, cycle of the party congresses and uh, government congresses, and uh, that uh, we, we haven't really, we're, we're at the early stages of uh, studying the domestic politics of, uh, of China's ch changes about, the, about uh, Taiwan politics, but it seems clear uh, from early uh, study that uh, Zhang's coercive diplomacy in, in the 1990s was deemed by the end of his term uh, unsuccessful. That, that the most famous episode being the 1995-1996 missile crisis. And so uh, Hu Jintao introduced a new politics uh, with coming to power uh, with uh, focusing on peaceful rise, then peaceful development, and then uh, you know, harmonious world and so forth, and a new, a new Taiwan politics. This is his, probably his most distinctive contribution to foreign policy was his new Taiwan politics, his new Taiwan policy. Uh, and he did, uh, on the one hand, he toned down the rhetoric, the, uh, the threatening rhetoric that had been emitted from Beijing every time the uh, politicians in Taiwan discussed Taiwan, the prospect of Taiwan independence or their hopes for Taiwan independence. He, he toned down the rhetoric. He stopped emitting threats against Taiwan every time this happened and uh, relied more heavily on the United States to discipline Taiwan, he tried to persuade the United States. To, so the United States became, became involved in admonishing Taiwan not to jeopardize uh, peace across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, this was very visible in 2003, I think it was in December of 2003 when uh, uh, George W. Bush stood with Wen Jiabao and said together that uh, Chen Shui-bian was jeopardizing the status quo in the, in the Taiwan Strait. And so this, uh, this was a, uh, a major shift in, in, in Beijing's Taiwan politics, and it was a major success story. It was a very high-risk move because there is a very strong hawkish element in, in Beijing, uh, but it proved to be successful, and it, it, the success materialized at the point when it was most in danger because at, at 2005, with the passage of the anti-succession law, uh, he was in, in at serious risk of alienating West, both Western Europe and the United States because of the hard edge of that law. But at the same time, the softer edge, he emphasized the softer edge and succeeded in inviting uh, Taiwanese politicians to China, to, to China uh, beginning with Len Zhan and Sung Chu Yu. And this made a major diplomatic departure for both Taiwan and the mainland. It culminated in 2008 in uh, Ma Ying-jeou's victory uh, in which he consolidated these gains, these diplomatic gains made by Lian and uh, Sung. And uh, as you know, things are moving from there very, very, very swiftly. So that's the domestic politics of the China, of the China angle. Taiwan's political bat battleground. Uh, after Lian and Sung visited in 2005, it changed the domestic political game in Taiwan. Uh, it became possible to take a more accommodating stance toward Beijing without committing political suicide beginning in 2005. Uh, Lien tested the waters and after that uh, it became possible for Ma to also do this. Uh, 
there was also domestic, there has also been some domestic political payoff so far in terms of great, uh, boost in tourism, trade, and so forth. No huge windfall, but there has been promise, there have been promises of greater economic progress in the future. On the identity issue, this is the always the downfall of pan blue politicians in Taiwan. Uh, and it's funny, but and it, it, this still bears further investigation, but identity seems to have lost its traction towards the end of the uh, Chen Shui-bian administration. Uh, there are several reasons for this. Uh, I think speculative reasons, we need further research, but I think one reason is that uh, Beijing played a smarter game by, not, uh, by learning not to provoke Taiwan, not to, not to threaten Taiwan every time Taiwanese politicians threatened to move towards independence. So I think that uh, the cooler atmosphere of, of Beijing helped a great deal. Uh, but also the uh, pol politics of the campaign politics of Ma. He simply, uh, he didn't contest the fact that he was a mainlander, that he you know, was born in Hong Kong of mainland parentage. He simply didn't talk about identity politics. And uh, because there was not a great threatening threat from Beijing. He talked about economics. He said he, he and what played into his hands, of course, was a corruption issue, uh, the, which sprang up in 2006. The corruption issue was a windfall for the Pan Blue, and they, they, they that reinforced their image of the opposition of the uh, incumbent party as economically incompetent, and uh, this. This identification with economic incompetence and corruption was his big payoff, and the uh, and the uh, Pan Blue won big. This is, of course, uh, Ma, and this is the margin of victory. This was this was the margin of victory was exaggerated actually by the new electoral in, uh, arrangements were made with the electoral mechanism. So this shows that the. Identity didn't change. Taiwan identity, sense of identity, did not change. Uh, in fact, it became even stronger identifying with Taiwan and not with the mainland. Uh, so he just uh, Ma's strategy on this was simply not to contest it and to uh, and to focus on the economics, and that worked. But the identity issue is still out there, and it's being revived currently. And we'll see how much traction it has uh, if what. The trade-off right now, as I see it, is that Ma will be willing to trade a nominal concession on identity for, for actual material benefits in terms of trade and investment opportunities, uh, access to markets, access to uh, Southeast Asia, for example, through ASEAN plus one and so forth. And whether the Taiwan people will buy that is uh, uncertain, it's still being contested. So you have these crisscrossing cleavages, the greens and the blues. You have the winners and the losers and how they play it out uh, in these. Washington. Uh, Washington's also had a political contest. And Washington has typically, during elections, been anti-communist. That's been a, 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 a good play for the opposition. Not necessarily Republicans, although they, they have a particular gift at running anti-communist campaigns, but any, uh, any sort of uh, outs, people on the outs can attack, uh, Clinton proved that in 1992, he attacked the George H.W. Bush administration for being soft on the butchers in Beijing, so it proved that Democrats can play the same game. Uh, it, in 2008, however, it didn't happen. The news was that it wasn't a big issue, the uh, outs against the ends. Uh, they didn't bring up China. Why? Uh, well, once one is that China played nice. China was not uh, issuing threats at that time. They were, in fact, cooperating. They, had, they staged the six-party talks in, in Beijing to discuss North, North Korea. They weren't uh, threatening Taiwan and so forth. And second, uh, Chen Shui-bian was uh, behaving from the American perspective very inconveniently, let's put it uh, at least that way, uh, in threatening to sort of uh, provoke war across the Taiwan Strait at the time the United States was engaged in two wars in the Middle East. So it, it was not an, not an issue in 2008, and the Americans didn't 
come into play. Now, globalization issue. The globalization issue is that uh, Taiwan has become very, very heavily in, in dependent upon trade, ex international trade. Uh, I think it's close to 100 percent. Uh, somebody probably has a figure on uh, Taiwan's trade dependency ratio. That's trade to GDP. Uh, and it's uh, two points here. One is cross-strait trade. Ta ta Taiwan is now, uh, its biggest trade partner is the mainland. It surpassed Japan and the United States. Uh, but the other thing is that Taiwan is also dependent internationally. It's dependent on Southeast Asia. So it, even its alternatives, uh, the way to, what ha what's happened is China has become more multilaterally involved in trade itself. China is the biggest trading part power in the world today. Uh, just for surpassed Germany last year. So China has been making trade deals with the various trade partners. And when he makes these trade deals, it tends to shut Taiwan out because of sovereignty, sovereignty issue. So China has acquired the power to uh, isolate Taiwan economically. And uh, it makes Beijing the gatekeeper of Taiwan's economic future, in a sense, because Taiwan is dependent on international trade for its, uh, for its continued prosperity. So ECFA, the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, is needed both to preserve the cross-strait uh, trade relationship, which has become vital to Taiwan, and, and also for trade with other countries, especially Southeast Asian countries, because when, ECFA, when the ECFA come as, came into being, which was January 1st of this year, it uh, in, eliminated all tariffs between the between the largest group of uh, free trade association in the world, about two billion people, all, including all of the 10 Southeast Asian countries plus China, and uh, applied a 9% tariff to everybody else. So Taiwan would be out of this if they don't get into ECFA, which the calculus is if they get into ECFA, they would get into uh, the same trade that China has with Southeast Asia, and they won't be shut out by this 9% trade tariff barrier. This is Taiwan's growth and unemployment. The, third, the other factor about Taiwan's uh, globalization is that it's been declining. Uh, ta Taiwan's growth has been declining, that is to say. Taiwan, uh, what's happened is first, there's a decline in investment in Taiwan. Uh, money does not come to Taiwan as readily as it came in the past. Ta this was a big driver of growth in Taiwan. And money doesn't come to Taiwan if it's being threatened by missiles from across the strait. So this is the, the, the strait crisis in 95, 96 has had an enduring impact, we think, on the situation in Taiwan. It, you'd have rather invest in a place from which the missiles are coming rather than a place that are, is being targeted by the missiles. So uh, Taiwan has been lagging behind, especially China, in terms of growth. It hasn't been doing that badly in terms of general growth, but especially since 2000, especially the 2000 to 2008, 2008 period was not a great period for economic growth for Taiwan. They got hit by their biggest recession uh, probably in their history in the early 2000s with the high tech uh, recession and they haven't done too well since that time. So this was of course a major factor and its salvation seems to be again with the ECFA and with greater access. This is cross-strait ties and their importance. Uh, these are some of the politics of asymmetric dependency. A the asymmetry is something that uh, uh, Wu and Womack have uh, uh, illuminated as, as especially sharply. The growing asymmetry between China and Taiwan is a major factor. That doesn't mean that the future is written on the wall for Taiwan. That doesn't mean, mean Taiwan is doomed or anything like that. You can do all sorts of things with asymmetry. Weak powers have, still have power vis-a-vis uh, -vis strong ones, but it certainly changed the, the relationship. In 1980, uh, Taiwan is about a third as large as the mainland GDP. Now it's about, what is it, one-ninth or something. It's the third largest province, uh, chi China, rates these provinces and puts Taiwan on there as one of, as one of its provinces and it's the third largest province surpassed now by, by both Guangdong and Shandong uh, provinces. So this, the triangular aspect. Uh, the triangular aspect is that uh, 
uh, it's a, in, during the Cold War, Taiwan was a dependent, dependent on this great strategic triangle between the United States, China, and the PRC, uh, and the Soviet Union. Uh, since the disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991, uh, the U.S. PRC Taiwan triangle has become autonomous from this, uh, and it operates according to the relative strength of the participants in the small triangle without relation to any sort of external external sort of uh, in index or, or guide. So uh, I can wrap this up pretty quickly, I think. So what happens now with, the, with Ma's new course in, in Taiwan politics, the new triangle? It looks like a, a, a menage a trois, right? I mean, because everybody's relationships with one another are good. But it's going to be tricky. Uh, this is the way it's evolved since 1991. Rough, uh, since 1949, you see the uh, configuration during the Cold War, the Cold War period, the configuration during the late Cold War period when the United States and China, when the open, had the opening to China counterbal to counterbalance balance the Soviet Union, and then the period since the, since the Cold War. Uh, since the Cold War, we've gone through, I think, three phases. The first period, the mainland fever period from 1990 to 1995. The second, the cross strait freeze from 96 to 2005. And the third, the current phase, the cross strait uh, thaw from 2005 until now, uh, which is a sort of echo of the early mainland fever of 1990 to 1995. Uh, the security dimension is very central to the triangle, and here we see the growing threat from the PRC, which defies the logic of the triangle, which is that we have a menage a trois, everybody loves each other, but there is, this is a J-10, uh, wholly indigenously produced, except for the engine, I guess the engine is imported. This is a Chinese, Chinese fighter. They don't buy so much from the Soviets anymore, from the Russians anymore, because they build their own. Arms sales to Taiwan from the United States is the only counterbalance that Taiwan has, and China regularly complains, as you've seen in the paper, about the arms sales to Taiwan. Uh, so Taiwan's current outlook, uh, I think uh, we can look forward, well, this is, I've covered this. The new course he wants to improve cross-strait relations, proclaim three no's, gives Beijing his wish list, Beijing is eager to please. Uh, this is a sort of compromise that looks like it's coming into being. Uh, so tourism is taking off, certainly. And uh, well, this is the uh, sort of ultimate outcome, a time-sensitive opportunity window. Uh, Ma's administration comes to an end in 2012, and uh, at the same time, uh, Hu Jintao steps down as party chair, and they'll both want to have, to have something to achieve, and will they do it, to have that window of opportunity? Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Didmo. Sorry for the limitation of time. Um, okay, uh, the next uh, paper presenter is uh, Professor uh, Dr. Lin, and uh, the topic he's going to present is the state power and the Dynamism of cross trade economic relations. Uh, Dr. Lam, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Pre uh, President Bao, and my colleagues, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my great pleasure to share some of my observations and my views about current tendencies and the future prospect of our cross-strait economic relations. So today I'm going, to, I'm, tr I'm going to try my best to go beyond the state society dichotomy and trying to um, understand how would the state re-intervene in this important relationship. So uh, first of all, uh, let me briefly introduce um, the current trend of cross-strait economic relations. Actually, from my observation, it's more like uh, from bilateral to the global division of labor. In the past, we tend to regard Taiwan, China, economic relationship, relationship as a bilateral, right? talking about uh, hollowing out effects or uh, trade dependency. 
But now I will argue that uh, given the fact about the uh, more intensive global division of labor, Taiwanese investment in the trade is a part of the process of globalization. And also uh, from labor intensive to a more comprehensive operation between Taiwan and uh, China. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about more detail in my following um, uh, slides about how would the Taiwanese state enhance the R&D capacities and other related treatment. And also from the re-export to the domestic market. In the past, Taiwanese investment in China focused on the reprocessing and then export to the international market. Now the domestic market of China is more attractive and also because of the economic downturn since last year, uh, the lot of new policies to attract domestic consumptions, that has become a very important factor for promoting next round of cross-trade economic relations. And from manufacturing oriented to the R&D oriented, this is a major focal point for the Taiwanese government trying to endeavor uh, for the future development to enhance the R&D capacities and then to create a more comprehensive division of labor, and also transformation of the role of the state to manage, to govern, and to intervene this, into this, uh, the whole process. So what are the internal and external changes of the, the so-called the Taiwanese developmental state? Let me just briefly touch upon that because, because of the time constraint. Actually, um, State capacities and the more comprehensive dependency in the Cold War era is really related to the, the, the biggest export market of the United States. At the same time, the United States provides the security guarantee of the continuous development of Taiwan. But in cross-trade relations, continuous economic interaction could not guarantee the security uh, guarant uh, protections. That is the major difference between Taiwan during the authoritarian past in the Cold War framework and uh, Taiwan during the era of globalization. So the major problem is how to intervene into this kind of governed interdependence, given the fact that the role of the state is shrinking, given the fact that the role of the state is going to retransfer itself into a new vehicles to promote globalization. So that's why many scholars adopt various frameworks such as the su uh, disciplined support or global governance or new kinds or new types of state business alliances to try to understand uh, the new dynamics of cross-trade economic relations and also the new attempts and incentives to improve the infrastructure, especially the educational reform. Actually, this is a kind of a struggle for the most advanced talents around the world. Um, most of the ethnic Chinese circles are trying to enhance their capacities to attract the advanced talents. So this is a kind of a new angles for the state to intervene. And also, given the fact that most of the Taiwanese um, uh, investments are concentrated in some specific areas, so we should never neglect the importance of the role of the local government or local state to play some specific role in this kind of relationship. Uh, this morning we talked about the case of Jingmen. Actually, there are more people to talk about the case of uh, Yangtze River Delta area or uh, Pearl River Delta area and now the Huan Bohai areas. The local incentives, the local attempts, how will they coordinate with the central incentives for this kind of relate, uh, 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 unique relationship. But in any case, the whole picture is kind of a fragmented. Uh, we're, when we notice the fragmented uh, state structure, we also notice the fragmented state business alliances. And also we notice some parallel lines of business incentives and the differences between state and the business uh, policies. So, so this is more like a readjustment of the state in a society. So that's why we argue that even though the Taiwanese state tried to intervene, this kind of intervention is a kind of uneven intervention of the state power. And also we are talking about the adjustment of the scope of the state intervention. For instance, the state can no longer regulate the investment activities, but the state can readjust its role to enhance the R&D in Taiwan. But we have to ask what kind of policies will the state adopt? 
whether these policies will be effective, and also whether these policies will be constrained by the domestic as well as global um, uh, forces. So it's more like a network state to cooperate with some semi-state actors or non-state actors. And also we try to understand whether political factors will handicap this kind of new alliances between state and non-state sectors. So it's more like a state in society, if not a state versus society. And stay in society under the umbrella of globalization. That is uh, why we try to understand that if state cannot intervene in some specific areas, we try to analyze whether the state will intervene to reshape the value, reshape the culture. Uh, for instance, to reshape the Taiwanese identity. If you want to invest to China, you are kind of betrayed to Taiwan. You'll have a shift of your Taiwanese identity. So this, this is another instrument for the state to use non-economic policies or non-economic instrument to try to redirect the general uh, tendencies. So that's why I argue that it's more like a mutual transformation between the state and the society. And we are trying to understand some informal mechanism beyond the traditional power of the state or tra traditional capacities of the state. But all these pictures were embedded in some existing structure of past dependency, and uh, we understand the critical uh, 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 junctures and some critical points. So readjustment of cross-strait economic relations could be demonstrated in the following aspect. First of all, the anti-market attempts to sabotage or to, to redirect the cross-strait relations proved to be fruitless. And also since the year 2008, President Ma Ying-jeou tried to reopen the cap. But once you reopen the cap, you will encounter more challenges. It's not that kind of a rosy picture. Uh, so we have to understand how will the Taiwanese state to co cope with these new challenges after opening all these uh, new rounds of uh, cooperation. So that's why we have to focus on innovation attempts and investment in higher education and some other service-oriented policies, such as um, we, try, we try to transfer Taoyuan International Airport into an air city project and to try to regain the status of Taiwan as the Asia-Pacific logistic center, and service hub, that kind of uh, uh, arrangement. Also, the negotiation on ECFA. The negotiation on ECFA is not just purely a bilateral or global, it's also very important domestic concern. So talking about enhancing R&D as a major angle of the Taiwanese state to intervene, uh, many scholars notice that R&D in Taiwan or the Taiwanese firms' policies on R&D is a reflection about the past dependency of Taiwanese firms. Also, it's closely related by Taiwan's industrial policy, uh, as uh, Professor Chi Wang Wen and others um, indicated. So it's more like a development beyond catching up from the late development to a more mature development. And also, because of the nature of the OEN, ODN nature of the Taiwanese firms, these R&Ds really lack a kind of uh, integration. And also, the major, major characteristic of these uh, R&Ds are the so-called design to order. In many cases, the Taiwanese ODN, OEM firms will organize various teams to serve different mother companies. So this is more like uh, design to for order to serve the mother company. And the Taiwanese firms do not control the real key technology of the upstream uh, development and uh, um, uh, research. So that's why uh, after the new development of cross trade relations, people are asking about whether we can transfer these firms from the ODM oriented to the OBM, own brand manufacturing. But if you want to transfer into the OBM manufacturing, first of all, you need the market. Second of all, secondly, you need to have a, a state of art or ca a cutting edge technologies. So that turned to our thinking about whether we should have a new bridge across the Taiwan Strait. So other related treatments by the Taiwanese government to try to intervene is that, for instance, 
to re-guide the returning Taiwanese business uh, from mainland China to upgrade their industrial level, and also some new laws on promoting innovation and development. It seems to be a traditional instrument of the state. But at the current stage, there are some controversies about this because for these new laws, um, the government is going to provide new tax breaks on research development, human resource, resources training, logistics, and some operation centers. But this new proposal was um, um, a boycott in the legislative run because of the concerns about the new KMT CCP alliances to introduce more mainland investment to Taiwan. And also um, there are some arguments uh, uh, concentrating that these new laws will benefit only specific business groups. So again, this, it, 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 this has become a non-economic controversies. There are lots of uh, domestic concerns and uh, domestic uh, constraints. And also the new policy, actually I would argue that it's the first time in cross-strait history for the government to try to uh, intervene, the so-called uh, the bridging project uh, da Chao Ji Hua. Um, it's a state incentives um, promoted by the Ministry of Economic Affairs and uh, ITRI, uh, the major state-sponsored uh, research uh, institutions. And the state selects some specific areas for concentration or enhancement, such as herbal medicine, uh, photovoltaics, LED lightning, distribution, telematics. Actually, the ultimate goal is trying to promote two-way investment, not just the Taiwanese investment to China, but, Taiwan, uh, but the mainland Chinese investment to Taiwan. It's so more like uh, a two-way investment or the more comprehensive uh, div division of labor. And um, the, the real ambition is trying to set up a new standard or to have a combined forces by Taiwan and China to promote the standard setter uh, in many related technologies and uh, transferring Taiwan as the path platform of international logistics. So this plan will go beyond cross-trade economic relations, but to transfer Taiwan or retransfer Taiwan, uh, we are kind of a long delay, uh, to retransfer Taiwan into a, a platform of international uh, logistics. And also to rejuvenate the global networks as uh, many uh, revised the version of the globalized the development of state argue that the match of interest of state and so many semi-state sectors such as uh, business association and uh, other related uh, uh, institutions or NGOs or semi-official NGOs to promote or to serve as arms of the government. Uh, so the government or the state per se will have a different forms, a different faces. Uh, other related examples like uh, uh, a Mount J, uh, Yushan, Kexie, and some other related, that even have some alliances with mainland Chinese business associations. And these associations, lots of them are gangos and other related, okay? And also alliances of the local government. Again, the most controversial issue at the current stage will be the uh, um, uh, uh, topics about ECFA, okay? So this could be closely related to distribution politics in Taiwan. That's why we argue that it's a multi-level games um, about the issue of ECFA. So ECFA will have a linkages and a spill over effects uh, on many uh, uh, aspects. And uh, the ultimate goal is trying to enhance Taiwan's international competitiveness as Professor Dittmer uh, already argued and also Professor Wu Yishan argued. It, but the, the enhancement of ECFA will be criticized as the urban-led uh, interest alliances and also it will have major concerns about Taiwan's electoral politics and uh, some more like uh, balancing politics to balance the development of the rich and the poor and development of the urban and the non-urban areas and development of the north and the south. This has become a major concern. But again, ECFA is also a reflection of the Taiwanese state to enhance its capacities about uh, political communication. How to explain this important trade-related arrangement to the public in Taiwan? 
Without a clear explanation about this important vehicle, it's hard to push forward for all these uh, uh, related arrangements by the power of the state only. No. So it provides a very comprehensive picture about globalization, the readjustment of the role of the state, uh, and also the new uh, incentives of the state to grasp or to cope with globalization. So in conclusion, we notice that um, it's a more like a rise of the network state uh, after the new rounds of closer uh, Taiwan Strait economic relations. But it refers to domestic and global alliances, different kind of alliances. So comparing to the past about the politicization process, the current policy is an, is, is an attempt to institutionalize the cross-strait relations, to provide some channels for the state to redirect or the state to guide or the state to cooperate with the civil society. So we have to reconsider many important concepts, just like uh, economic dependence. What is the current situation or definition of economic dependence and the role of political leadership? I think we should never neglect the importance about the human factor in redirecting this kind of uh, economic uh, importance. And also, we have a very high expectation, but we still need to face the reality and the figure of appropriate ways to analyze the general picture. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Lin. Um, I think uh, um, during the past so many years, uh, the confrontations the, between the two big issues that are very, you know, always the grave concerns of for many scholars and the politicians across Taiwan Strait. One is identity, so that's a big issue in Taiwan. And uh, another one is sovereignty, is a big issue in uh, Mene. And uh, uh, um, I think still, you know, until right now, I think that for the uh, government of the Beijing, uh, still never to renounce the use of force against the Taiwan uh, due to the sovereignty issue. So I think we are very uh, curious about the how to pursue the peace uh, uh, be, due to the uh, very complicated interaction between these two big issues. So uh, we are very happy to have the, uh, Dr. Lin here, and uh, his uh, topic is uh, search for cross-trade peace. I think uh, we should be very glad to hear the, the voice the, on behalf of the Chinese men and uh, what's their perspective about this uh, uh, complicated issue. Uh, Dr. Lin, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your, your nice introduction. But I'm afraid uh, I don't speak here as an individual scholar. Not to, I'm sorry. Uh, nothing to do with the government. And uh, I'd like to thank the two conference organizers, uh, including Professor Lowe Didema, for the nice invitation. And it is a great honor of me to be here with such a group of distinguished professors. And the topic, yes, is uh, searching for cross-strait peace. As we all know, uh, since the, uh, Taiwan's second power turnover and happened in 2008, uh, there have been a window of opportunities for political, political dialogue between the two sides. However, how to turn the opportunity into the reality and remain a uh, difficult issues. And uh, I think this kind of uh, difficult issues is depending on the four conditions. First is the precondition for conducting political uh, dialogue. Uh, second, uh, the possible formulas for redefining political relations across the Taiwan Strait. The third, the contents of political dialogue. The fourth, the path of peaceful development of cross-strait relations. Let me be begin with the first issue, the, the so-called 1992 consensus. My point here is the historically, the 1992 consensus has had two meanings, two levels, two levels of meanings. One is the both sides adhere to the one China principle. That means they uh, exclude the options 
of two channels or one channel one Taiwan as a solution for Taiwan's future. Another meaning now we uh, intentionally put aside is at that time both both sides strive for China's reunification in the future. So I would like to call the first one uh, as low independence, Budu, as a, a weak principle of one China. The second one, one unification, is what I would like to call the strong principle of one China. Weak principle and strong principle. Uh, we know that Chen Shui Ping's administration uh, denied the 1992 consensus. Uh, Ma Yingzhu uh, recognized that consensus at the very beginning, but the definition has cha changed. In fact, the Ma administration only accepts the first level of the meaning of 1992 consensus while rejecting the second one. The original consensus has been redefined by Taipei. Maybe we can call the so-called soft power because the definition has been rede redefined. Beijing still considers China's unification as the future goal, but accept that kind of uh, redefined 92 consensus. So we, the, we think the, the base has been, uh, the, the consensus has been uh, redefined, then provide a base for cross Australia to engage in political dialogue. From, from the perspective of Beijing, Taipei's restraint from unilaterally declaring Taiwan independence means it has accepted the weak principle of one China. The two sides therefore can find a common ground for building mutual trust. This weak principle can also be applied to the DPP. As Hu Jintao's six points mentioned, Beijing is willing to make a positive response to the DPP if it changes its position of separating Taiwan from the mainland. Here, no one China is mentioned when he, when in that paragraph, but he used a lot of words. So in that way, we can equal this kind of language as under the umbrella of uh, a uh, weak principle of one China. That's my interpretation, personal interpretation. And this means Beijing will not take Taipei's acceptance of unification goal as the precondition for opening straight political dialogue and the rich peace agreement between the two sides, even though some scholars in Beijing in China still think it is should. I mean, the unification should be taken as a precondition uh, for political dialogue. So that's my uh, point here. In brief, even though the two sides of the Taiwan Strait that disagreed on the goal of unification, under the meaning of one China, they can seek mutual trust and set aside their disputes as long as Taiwan does not move to the dual independence. So that's the precondition for political dialogue. Second, political relations need to be redefined. To maintain peace across the Taiwan Strait, the two sides need to redefine the nature of their political relations. This is a new issue uh, raised up by Hu Jintao's six point. What is the political relations between the two? From Beijing's perspective, the relationship is not something between the central government and the local government, nor between the state and the state. Rather, it is between two political entities under the framework of constitutional one China, Xian Fa Yichun. Although the two entities govern their domestic affairs respectively, so-called zhi quan feng shu, and oppose against each other politically, they are not split into two countries. That's Beijing's interpretation of the state core. Since the constitution of the PRC and the ROC considers the territory currently controlled by the other side as the sphere of its own sovereignty, and the international community respects the principle of one China, that means no uh, diplomatically recognizing the two sides simultaneously, not at the same time, not cross recognition. Law allowing dual 
dual representation of the two sides in international organizations that require statehood as a membership. So, so as long as the international community respect their kind of principle, uh, the status quo of one China has not been changed. Even Taiwan still maintain 23 diplomatic allies. Doesn't mean there's no two Chinas. That's Beijing's perspective, I believe. So in Beijing mind, one key point of political relations uh, between the two sides is that they remain in a symbolic state of war, state of war, and do not recognize each other in terms of constitution or sovereignty. Such a political confrontation is resulted from the Chinese Civil War 60 years ago. As the main successor of the First Republic, the PRC took over most part of its territory, while the ROC was retreated to a limited jurisdictory area. The two sides of the Taiwan Strait continue the state of war over the issue of constitution and the international law regarding who should represent China, thus playing a political game within the one China framework. If we are allowed to view the Republic of China from 1991 to 1949 as the period of China's, uh, as a period of the first Republic in Chinese history, then the period from 1949 on and the prior to China's future reunification might be called the Second Republic. During this transitory period, the two sides practice different social systems and govern their own domestic affairs legitimately. The Chinese territory is not split as long as the two sides consider China as their common home constitutionally and symbolically. According to Liu Guosheng, the statehood of China looks like a ball, the surface of which is shared by both the PRC and the ROC as two political regimes competing for international space and in a back-to-back -back way without being closely recognized by the global community. For Liu, as a part of the ball, the two sides are asymmetrically in terms of the size of the surface they cover respectively, but they perform domestic governance and protect people in their own domain all the same. Uh, in a last cell, I would like to say they are politically separated, but not legally divorced. So the changing state of the political relationship between the two sides from stressed confrontation and the mutual exclusiveness to peaceful interaction and the mutual development lies in the acceptance of one China in principle, one China in principle, while leaving flexible room for political manipulation. Uh, culturally, the people on the two sides of the Taiwan Strait should be considered part of the Chinese nation, even though more people on Taiwan now identify themselves as Taiwanese rather than both Taiwanese and the Chinese. The identity of the Chinese nation in a cultural sense, I think, is still acceptable to most Taiwanese legally both political entities should ad adhere to the weak principle of one China avoiding confrontation on the issue of secession and anti-secession. From 1949 toward the end of Jiang period, the two sides carried a legacy of Chinese civil war and engaged in a zero-sum game in the international arena over who should represent China, either the PRC or ROC. Such a hostile doctrine demonstrated to the global community, ironically, that the sovereignty of one China was claimed by both sides. From 1903 to 2008, political crisis between the two parties occurred many times amid swift 
development of economic and cultural relations, one of the causes, one, was the Taiwan authorities during that period attempted to alter the status quo of cross strait political relations by cutting legal linkage between the two sides, either internationally or constitutionally. The latter is referring, used to refer to the Chen administration. Although the, the administration once shifted back from the position of mutual recognition to that of no denial and the low recognition, in 1999, in regard to the PRC's sovereignty and legitimacy, uh, it changed this position, ambiguous uh, position, uh, soon to the so-called state-to-state relationship. So that changed the situation. Judging from the past experience, the nature of cross-strait political relationship is better defined as separate but not legal divorce again. And uh, the PRC has never exercised its effective rule of Taiwan, to be sure, and the political legitimacy of Taiwan authorities lies in Taiwan's people's dedication, democratically speaking. The Taiwan Authority not only enjoy domestic jurisdiction and governing effectiveness, but also maintain a self-running defense and foreign system, including a group of diplomatic allies. However, due to Beijing's insistence on the one China principle, it is impossible for the two sides to be diplomatically cross-recognized by other countries, nor might they simultaneously join international organizations that require statehood. Constrained by Beijing's bottom line of opposing Taiwan's independence, even at the core price of war, Taiwan has not declared formal independence or constitutionally given up its sovereignty over China, over the mainland. So that's the uh, uh, reality. Uh, unlike two parties in a real world, who must first give up a territory claim over the other side in order to sign a peace treaty. The precondition for the two sides of Taiwan Strait to reach a peace agreement is just to insist on national identity that both sides belong to one China and avoid the legal separating of two sovereignty of China. Then I move to the shared, so-called shared uh, sovereignty and uh, separated uh, governance. This is not no uh, new things. In fact, the Taiwan's uh, size raised up this proposal many, many years ago, back in the early 1990s, but many uh, didn't accept that. But now we are talking about, to, we are doing some research on that kind of issue, so-called shared sovereignty and the separated governance. Uh, talking about sovereignty, we, one way is to separate the concept of foreign sovereignty from domestic sovereignty. That's one way. Another way is to make a theoretical distinction among different dimensions of the concept of sovereignty. According to uh, Professor Kressner, the first dimension is domestic sovereignty. I think Taiwan enjoyed that completely, domestic sovereignty. The, the second is uh, Taiwan's authorities enjoy the absolute rule, rule over Taiwan. Also have that kind of, enjoy that kind of uh, dimensions of sovereignty. The third is the international legal sovereignty. For in this regard, I have touched upon that kind of issue already. That means it's very difficult to say. Then the fourth is the, um, the, the control board, uh, in independence sovereignty. Taiwan still uh, so also control the border. If I want to apply to get into Taiwan, I got to get permission from the authorities. So if we judging from, if we consider sovereignty as a uh, unique thing and, uh, and uh, any political public organizations, authorities, if they want to be qualified as a sovereignty state, they have, they have, have they have to have all these kind of dimensions, but obviously Taiwan lacks some of them, so it is the sovereignty is very ambiguous. And the one way to resolve problem, problem is, as uh, I said earlier, is the two sides to share the sovereignty, to share. 
to share the uh, different way to do that. One, for example, Taiwan's diplomatic allies uh, remained to be 23. That kind of thing is uh, out of our imagination two years ago. And, uh, but this happened. So mean the two sides can work out, use some skillful way to resolve that kind of uh, issue and to satisfy the Taiwan's demand for more international space as long as they are not closely recognized by other countries. They don't appear in the international organization as two states, but with two seats, use flexible uh, name uh, meaning. I think uh, international space is a very important one. Even in the 1990s, many scholars raised up the possi possibilities of to sign a uh, peace treaty between the two sides, low independence and the low war. But without resolving Taiwan's international space, the kind of tough issue, that kind of agreement couldn't be achieved. Uh, even result in a, a horrible uh, situation since 1995. So now we move back, we look back at the history, we need to consider that kind of things. So for the content of peace uh, uh, agreement, that the uh, low independence, low war, and the Taiwan's international participation should be uh, fully considered into as a part of the content of the peace agreement. And uh, I think uh, that uh, even though many scholars nowadays argue the economy should take a first, economy first. But in fact, uh, we are facing inevitably political issues. So we have to think something unthinkable. Maybe it is too uh, remote, but we need to do our best. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Lin's uh, interesting observation. Um, I think the uh, mutual understanding is uh, very important uh, to uh, set up a mutual trust. So the next topic is um, uh, familiarizing the next generation of China scholars with Taiwan. Uh, Professor Go, please. Thank you very much. I'd also like to uh, add my thanks to uh, Professors Wu and Ye for uh, including me in this very interesting conference uh, from which I've already learned quite a bit and uh, has given me quite a bit to think about. Now, I flew nonstop from Beijing to Taipei on Air China yesterday. And last March, I flew from Taipei to Beijing nonstop on uh, EVA. Both flights were packed, full of screaming babies, businessmen, tourists, nothing out of the ordinary, except how extraordinary it was. For older Taiwanese uh, and for Chinese, it goes without saying. But for those of us China scholars of a certain age, the ability to fly nonstop across the Taiwan Strait or even to go to the mainland was for a very long time inconceivable. In fact, well into the 1970s, uh, even going to the mainland. To learn and live Mandarin, the only place to go was Taiwan. And the elite program was IUP, the Inter-University Program for Chinese Language Studies. Most members of the Chinese studies community trained in the 1960s and the 1970s spent time at IUP. Even though very few of them actually had a research interest in Taiwan itself. Now, I'm not going to go into the history. I've, I've go, go over this in my paper, and I'm not going to go over it now. But IUP was established in 1963 at uh, Taida. The administrative office of uh, IUP was at Stanford University from 1963 until 1997. So IUP was known informally as the Stanford Center. Uh, but it was actually a consortium of, um, the numbers vary, but of a number of different American universities. The, the Stanford Center, which I'll call it for a while, um, had great support and backing from the top levels of the national government uh, on Taiwan. The Ministry of Education provided a number of scholarships for American students to study at, uh, at the Stanford Center. Uh, Taida, which is the, the Stanford Center, was, uh, was located at Taida. Uh, and uh, Taida also provided a great deal of support for the Stanford Center, but never formally. There was no formal agreement. Uh, uh, I, I learned as a process, in, as part of doing research for this paper, that the Stanford Center never paid rent and never paid utilities uh, for its occupation of prime real estate on the Taida campus. Uh, it also had very little to do with Taida itself, except for occupying prime real estate. 
Now in 1979, uh, the, the Committee on Scholarly Communication with the People's Republic of China, uh, based in the United States, and other American universities after the 1978 signing of an educational exchange betw agreement between the US and, and Beijing, rushed to the mainland to establish programs there. Initially, IUP did not plan to move from Taiwan to the mainland, but in the 1990s, it started to consider uh, opening a second program on the mainland, but the, but the main program was going to stay at Taida. Then in the 1990s, things turned to sour here in Taipei for IUP. Now, I don't have time to go into the details uh, of this. Uh, I go through some of it in the paper, uh, and it's not the central part, uh, central point of the paper, but in the process of doing research into this, it's, it, it's a really fascinating topic, and if anybody's looking for a, an, a master's paper topic, uh, it would certainly be something uh, to pursue. The essence is that the Taida Wen Shui Yan wanted the 18,000 square feet of real estate that, Taida, that the Stanford Center was occupying uh, in the new Yuan Dalo uh, uh, on the Taida campus. It, it moved from its original location in one of the old Japanese buildings to the Yuan Dalo near Xinghai Lu uh, in 1985. Now, uh, beginning, it was in really the early middle 1990s that things started to go south. This was the same time that Chen Shui-bian became mayor of Taipei, that there was the rise in the push for a Taiwanese identity, and that there was resistance to the idea of Mandarin as being the language of Taiwan, and the implications of this, that Taiwan is a part of China and not an island occupied by the exiled mainlander Republic of China government, which imposed Mandarin on the people of Taiwan. So the politics of teaching Mandarin suddenly became, um, uh, became a, a hot button issue um, at Taida with the Stanford Center of caught, course caught right in, the, right in the middle of this. As I said before, not only did you have these political issues going on, and I haven't been able to draw a complete causal uh, line between the political changes uh, and the Wen Shuyan's desire, desire, sudden desire for more, for more office space. Uh, but it is definitely a fact uh, that IUP was, uh, as was referred to um, as a freeloader uh, on the, on the Taida campus and was not integrated into, um, into Taida campus life. The upshot was that the Stanford Center that IUP left Taida and Taiwan in 1997 and moved to the Tsinghua University campus uh, in Beijing. In the course of doing my research, uh, interviewing people from both sides of the of the departure, uh, it, it really struck me that there still is a great residue of bitterness and misunderstanding uh, on both sides. Um, and um, as a result of uh, t uh, Stanford Center's departure, uh, Taiwan lost a certain amount of support uh, among um, the American China Studies community, uh, so that this bitterness uh, still became, still is quite palpable. The space in the Yuandalo became the International Center for, for Chinese Language, uh, International Chinese Language Program, uh, which in its um, promotional materials claims to be the new incarnation of the Stanford Center, but it is not. Um, it, is, it has no institutional ties with, uh, with now what is now referred to as the Inter-University Program for Chinese Language Studies, even though we have begun to uh, work on some sort of uh, an exchange, but we are, but it is not officially have, does not officially have anything to do with, this, with the IUP. Now, this is where the paper becomes m more self-indulgent. Um, in 2000, for full disclosure, I became the executive director uh, of, uh, of IUP. And soon after I became the executive director, I was in Taiwan for a meeting, and I was approached by people from Zhengda and from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs asking me to move IUP back to Taida, uh, back to Taiwan, not to Taida, to Zhengda. And uh, I said I would approach the board with this, which I did. I serve at the pleasure of the board. Uh, and there was no support for that. Um, as you can imagine, it, it dredged up a lot of the, uh, the issues of why they had left Taiwan in the first place. In 2002, uh, John Thompson uh, became the resident director, the American field director uh, at, uh, at IUP in Tsinghua. Now, John um, was a person who first came to Taiwan in 1960 as a Marine, 
where they had to practice landing on the shores of, uh, I forget exactly where it was, but it was a military exercise. Then he was a student here from 1966 to 68, a diplomat through, a, through the 1970s, and again he was at AIT in the 1990s. In the meantime, he also served in Beijing. Uh, I met him in 1977, 78, when I was here doing my dissertation field work. Uh, official, my official Don Wei was actually Academia Sinica. And I had also lived in uh, Taiwan in the early 1970s. So both John and I had very deep ganching for Taiwan. And neither of us had a history with the Stanford Center. I had not studied at the Stanford Center. He had not studied at the Stanford Center. Uh, so we did not really have any of the legacy of bitterness uh, uh, that, that surrounded so many of the other members uh, of the IUP board. Uh, so we, we really were, were trying to cast about a way to reestablish some sort of a presence of IUP uh, on Taiwan. We recognized that the new generations of China scholars were very unlikely to go to Taiwan to study Mandarin now that they could go to the IUP or many programs on the mainland. As before, very few foreign scholars researched Taiwan and they did not really have much familiarity with the uh, burgeoning, dynamic, vibrant, largely foreign-trained scholarly community on the island, which studied not only Taiwan, but also studied China and a wide range of, uh, of other issues, as has been demonstrated in this conference so far. So based on our ganching for Taiwan and, uh, and earlier feelers from, uh, from Zhengda, we established what we call the Taiwan Familiarization Program. And a lot of this grew out in the early, uh, early period of around 19, 2003, 2004 uh, with Professor Liu Yijiu from Zhengda, who's very kindly uh, come today and will correct probably many of the errors in my, in my faulty memory. He's much younger than I am. And, um, uh, but I really have, have very, very grateful to him for his taking uh, so much of the uh, burden of, uh, of working with the Ministry of Education with the Zhengda administration so that we could establish this program. We wanted to introduce Taiwan as a vibrant society of worthy of study in its own right, rich in intellectual resources and researchable topics. Although short, um, uh, the, the program is short. One week would give these younger scholars a taste of Taiwan with the intention that they would return to satisfy a need they were previously unaware of. We also hope the participants in the Taiwan Familiarization Program would form a subsidiary community within the larger IUP community who could introduce Taiwan's opportunities to more students, a, a spread effect, building a unique bridge across the strait. Now, what, what happens, what, the first group of students from IUP Beijing, a group of five people, came over in January of 2005. Up to now, there had been seven small groups of students. Uh, they were five, and then the, the one that came last uh, June had nine members in it because it's become extremely competitive and extremely desirable now. Uh, among the students at IUP Beijing. Uh, they come, to, they, they fly, they, they, uh, they, they come to ta uh, Taiwan. They spend the first day learning about the Taiwan experience from a number of scholars uh, at, uh, at Zhengda. And then they go off on their own to meet uh, colleagues, uh, not all of whom are academics, uh, to learn of research opportunities and resources in Taiwan, to visit field sites, uh, to visit museums, companies, media outlets, and so on. Several of the people who have come are interested in Buddhism, and so they have gone to, uh, to Huali and to Siji. They've gone to Foguangshan. They've gone to Fagushan. Uh, they've traveled all over the island. Uh, the program has had uh, enormous, we've gotten a great deal of very, very positive feedback, uh, and it's not just that people enjoy being in Taiwan, but they've really had substantive exchanges um, with the colleagues um, who they have met here. A, num of, a number of them have revisited Taiwan or s extended their stays here after their initial uh, Taiwan familiarization program visit. And through the miracle of the internet and email, they have been able to maintain and expand their contacts with people uh, in Taiwan well after, the, um, w well after their return to, to, the main, to Beijing or, uh, or the return to the United States, or, or most of them are Amer have been Americans. Now, um, <laughs> Let me just give you a couple, read a couple of quotes from the paper. Uh, the individual itineraries brought home that it was, quote, easier to do research on Taiwan, unquote, than on the mainland. The academics they met were clearly more versed in international standards of scholarship in terms of, in terms of methods, point of view, and style of presentation. Scholars have access to materials as well as helpful staff to assist them. One scholar of Buddhism noted, quote, at the National Library of Taiwan, and, for, and the National Library's gotten a lot of rave reviews in our... Um, 
in the reports. One of the directors taught me how to use the new online Buddhist resources which have been developed by Taiwanese Buddhist scholars, unquote. He discovered, quote, many primary and secondary sources related to my topic which I have never known before, unquote. Another wrote, quote, I truly realized how much easier it is to do research in Taiwan. Many of the periodicals and journals they held are impossible to find in Beijing. Also, everyone on the staff was extremely helpful. I find that in Beijing, the staff or bureaucracy of more of, is more of a hindrance than a facilitator, unquote. Another student agreed with a professor she met who, quote, pointed out the difference between the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and Academia Sinica as being the difference between a mere bangong shi and a real yan zhou shi, unquote. Because of so many of Taiwan's scholars now visit the mainland regularly for conferences, teaching, and research, they were able to introduce the names of many scholars and data sources on the mainland to the Taiwan Familiarization Program participants. One visitor who was studying HIV AIDS NGOs in China had the following to say after meeting a Catholic NGO. Quote, a sister that I met was able to put me in touch with the Catholic Church here in Shenyang, which is also doing HIV AIDS outreach. So just last Sunday, I attended a mass here in Shenyang, after which the nuns did a special prevention preach on HIV AIDS, which is all to say none of this would have happened without the Taiwan trip. Uh, several IUP students noted the friendliness and hospitality of people in Taiwan. Even strangers on the street who offered directions, explained the subway system, and even bought tickets for them. One reported, quote, Taiwan has law, reason, humanity, civility, and trees, five things the mainland lacks, not, not to mention democratically elected leaders, a valid constitution, and a free press. As the locals say, Taiwan yo fa li qing he lu. People in Taiwan hold doors for strangers, allow subway bus passengers to get off before getting on, care about the environment, and, and respond to traffic accidents with CPR and calls for ambulances rather than asking Silamail. <laughs> <laughs> is he dead? Of course, the food received rave reviews. Uh, this is not the same Taiwan that I know, but this is <laughs> that just, uh, fortunately, I haven't uh, had, well, anyway. One surprise to me was the repeated comments on environmental consciousness in Taiwan and how green it is. One participant in, uh, flying over yesterday, believe me, flying from Beijing in February uh, two to Taipei was a piece of work. One participant wrote of the drive from Taiwan Airport to Taipei. Uh, we couldn't take our eyes off how lush were the greens, how pure the blues. Life seemed to be unfolding in living color. Beijing receded like a distant gray memory, unquote. And quote, clean roads, protected nature reserves, orderly lines, and generally soft-spoken people. Again, I don't know where they went. Um, <laughs> It took time to get used to receiving the Taiwanese version of your welcome, Beyond, Each time, overwhelming hospitality reminded me to discard my hardened Be Beijing shell and say thanks more often. Several remarked on how little people on either side of the strait knew about each other in spite of the numerous visits by tourists, business people, and academics. Of course, these are a function of who they met in the short time on the island but are notable impressions. Several of the TFP participants extended their visits to Taiwan and some have returned. Two of them have published articles using data collected here. One, Lila Buckley, had worked in China for an environmental NGO for several years before joining the sixth TFP in February last year. She was able to stay in Taiwan for two weeks after the formal activities ended, including a stint in the countryside. In her be very, very beautifully written article, she takes a more critical view of the pollution situation on the island. Um, so we, it, it's interesting, there's not only this generational change of, of, of foreign China scholars, in particular American China scholars, but there's also a generational change in Taiwan chi, uh, China scholars. And looking around the room, um, that's, that's quite clear. Um, in a, there's another program uh, which has also, uh, which, which came up in discussions today, which I would just draw attention to. It's from the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations called the Public Intellectuals Program, which, like the Taiwan Familiarization Program, is trying to build a sense of community across disciplines among a younger generation of China scholars, which is something that, um, that, that, that is, many of us feel has disappeared. So um, Michael and Tim... Anybody else here, or, or at least are two, have two members of this. And these groups have also come to Taiwan so that they are not only getting a mainland experience, but they're getting a Taiwan experience um, well. While the Taiwan Familiarization Program has not and will not reverse the trend of going to the mainland to learn Mandarin, we feel we have achieved more, our more modest goals of introducing aspects of Taiwan to this new generation. Uh, these are the, to a new generation of China scholars which they might not otherwise uh, get. Uh, it is functioning as a living bridge. Uh, I am pleased to announce that the eighth group of Taiwan familiarization uh, students, uh, seven, will arrive tomorrow 
uh, and I will go to participate in their briefing Monday at Jungdai. And is Professor Tung, are you meeting them on, are you briefing them? I thought I saw you, oh, okay, forget that. I thought I saw you on the, uh, on the agenda. So this paper is a case of soft power, which was discussed this morning, uh, operating below the storm with foreigners serving as a bridge across the strait. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gold. That's very uh, interesting introduction of the program. Uh, okay, the next I would like to uh, invite Dr. Xu to deliver your remarks. Uh, Dr. Xu, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's my uh, honor to be able to uh, comment on these two very rich papers within uh, only 15 minutes. This is quite a challenge for me, but let me try. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Professor Wu and Dittmer's paper, uh, this paper discusses uh, three factors contributing uh, to the rapprochement uh, across the street, namely the domestic competition, uh, the economic globalization, and the strategic triangle. Uh, the authors not only discusses the impact on the rapprochement, but also point out, point out the, pos the possible uh, alternative uh, causal mechanisms uh, of these three factors to the cross-trade relations. Um, uh, so uh, in the following, I would like to discuss the, di the, the, the possible alternative directions and the strengths and also uh, the interactions uh, among these three factors. Uh, regarding the first factor, the domestic factor, uh, uh, the first question is regarding uh, uh, mainland China's domestic uh, competition, political competition. Uh, in, in the upcoming 18th Party Congress in uh, 2012, uh, how would the, the authors evaluate the possible impact of such a, a power transition or political competition on the possible, uh, possible impact on the cross-strait uh, rapprochement? Uh, for example, uh, would the new, uh, the new uh, leader uh, will face the uh, uh, challenge from the Hawks, or would uh, Hu Jintao continue the CMC uh, president presidency uh, to contain uh, uh, this kind of possible uh, pressure. And regarding Taiwan's domestic competition, uh, we will also have a major uh, election in the year of 2012. And uh, what would uh, that uh, ma major uh, election uh, have uh, the impact on, on the cross-trade rapprochement, for example, uh, would uh, uh, my administration be challenged uh, on his, so to speak, pro-China uh, policy line? Uh, and uh, if there, uh, should there be uh, some talk about the peace uh, agreement across the street, uh, would that create a negative impact for Ma? So this is down the first factor. Uh, the second factor is uh, regarding the economic factor. Uh, I think the authors have mentioned that all these three factors are more instrumental than intrinsic in influencing the cross-strait rapprochement. But I found that the, uh, the economic factor actually is pretty intrinsic given the uh, evidence presented by the authors. Uh, I think uh, given the fact that Taiwan has been marginalized uh, it is almost inevitable for Taiwan to strike an uh, economic agreement such as ECFA with mainland China, uh, no matter which, which administration uh, uh, comes in power. Um, so if that is the case, uh, uh, if that is the case, then uh, should DPP uh, come in power in 2012, uh, would DPP government also have to uh, have this uh, kind of ECFA talk with mainland China? And on the other hand, uh, as we know, uh, the nature of this kind of uh, cross-trade economic talk is itself very political. Uh, it has not only has to do with the economic affairs, but also uh, affect uh, the distribution 
uh, the, the economic distribution within the island, as well as uh, other social transformations. Um, so I would like to ask, uh, under what circumstances and conditions uh, would the imperatives of the economic globalization and the regional integration may create uh, not a promoting effect, but a constraining effect uh, on the cross-strait uh, rapprochement. And the factor three uh, is regarding uh, the strategic interaction um, among the three sides. Uh, this is a very complicated issue. Um, uh, I can think of three questions. First of all, uh, the authors mentioned that uh, Washington is playing a pivot uh, role in the, this uh, strategic triangle. Uh, I can understand that under the, the DPP administration, uh, Beijing relies on Washington to manage the cross-strait relations to contain Taiwan from going too fast or going too uh, too radical toward the independence. However, under the Manjo administration, what kind of pivot role can Washington play? Because uh, by nature, the mob administration is a pro-unification. And uh, so naturally, it's going closer uh, toward Beijing. So why does Beijing need Washington to play a pivot under such a circumstance? Why would Beijing care more about Washington? And if that is the case, how would Ma administration uh, maintain a balance, or as author said, dual amity uh, between Washington DC and Beijing? And the second is Beijing, uh, Beijing's economic power and political status growing in the world. Isn't it true that Washington DC's pivot status will also be undermined gradually. And the third, recently uh, there are, I think, a round of many events, uh, confrontational events between Washington DC and Beijing, such as the Google event, uh, the arms sales to Taiwan, uh, or the upcoming Dalai Lama visit. Uh, if the Sino-US relations deteriorate, how would that affect the cross-strait relations? And lastly, let me talk about these, uh, the interactions uh, between these three factors. Uh, I'm going to talk about two interactions. One is between the economic factor and the domestic competition. Uh, uh, If a KMT administration, uh, given the fact that, that the uh, Taiwan has been gradually marginalized uh, economically in the region as well as in the world, Taiwan has to strike a deal uh, with Beijing on the economic front. Uh, and I think it's very natural to think that Beijing will use this uh, as a bargaining chip to develop a closer political ties uh, with, uh, with Taipei. But that creates a dilemma for KMT in its domestic competition. Uh, because it goes, if KMT administration goes too fast politically with Beijing, then we'll face challenge within domestic uh, competition. So how, what kind of strategy can KMT have to strike a balance between domestic competition and economic globalization? So that's one Interaction. Another interaction is between economic uh, globalization and the strategic relations. Uh, if Taipei improves the strategic relations with Washington, as mentioned, as suggested by the authors, to balance uh, its amity with Beijing, uh, then how would Beijing react, particularly? When, chi uh, when Taipei is seeking a closer uh, ties, uh, economic ties uh, with mainland China. So uh, these are the questions uh, uh, I can think of for the first paper. And for second paper, uh, presented by my old friend Lin Gang, I think, uh, you know, Lin Gang is from Fuzhou, 
you know, which is uh, located between Xiamen and Shanghai. So I think uh, Lin Gang's uh, argument carries the Shanghai characteristics as well as Xiamen characteristics <laughs> within the context of, of uh, mainland China's uh, Taiwan policy. Uh, <clears throat> because he has uh, many uh, very brief uh, and uh, colorful suggestions, such as strong and weak revision, uh, versions of China, a one China principle, or no denial, no recognition, or shared sovereignty, or one sovereignty state, two uh, governing entities. This has been also suggested by Liu Guoshen from Xiamen, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> uh, non-parallel dual membership, although I still have difficulty understanding what that could be. And uh, uh, very interestingly, he also mentioned the first republic, second republic, suggesting that in the future, maybe there will be a third republic. <laughs> this is very much like Wang Daohan's line. So I said uh, Lin Gang carries uh, a Fuzhou characteristic uh, of argument. But I like it. I think it's very colorful. Uh, however, because it's so uh, imaginative, uh, it also stimulates uh, us to think of more questions. And also, Lin Gang has a very interesting uh, comment that they, uh, to, to, the two sides is separated but not legally divorced. I can hardly remember I attended a, a wedding ceremony, but, but if you do, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> well, I, I have four questions regarding the, uh, Lin Gang's paper. The first question is the, the question of trust and confidence. Uh, Professor Lin mentioned that as long as Taiwan does not move toward independence, then uh, Beijing will have patience on the cross-strait relations, on the unification, actually. And the question, or, or arguments uh, similar to that. Then my question is, from Taiwan's perspective, honestly speaking, uh, we, have, we have this trust or confidence issue, problem. Uh, on how patient Beijing will be. How can we guarantee that Beijing will be patient? And uh, because uh, according to uh, many documents uh, Professor Lin mentioned in his paper, there are a lot of preconditions and uh, prerequisites for Beijing to maintain that patience. And those preconditions or prerequisites actually are subject to Beijing's very subjective interpretation. Um, so from our perspective, naturally, we would like to have a guarantor, a third party. If you cannot solve that problem, no, it's very natural we will have this kind of idea. And of course, I know Beijing doesn't like that idea. Um, so this leads to my second question. That is, how do we perceive the status quo? Professor Lee mentioned, as long as we don't do this, they will not do that, so the status quo will be maintained. But actually, the status quo is very slippery and very dynamic. Uh, many things are always changing. Um, for example, how do we differentiate uh, the efforts to promote unification in the long run and to realize unification in the short run? From the eyes of many people in Taiwan, they are the same thing. Any efforts to promote uh, the, the likelihood of uh, unification in the long run uh, are very threatening, immediately threatening to them. Uh, so, but from Beijing's uh, perspective, uh, if we are gonna solve the, this problem in the long run, they have to do this. Uh, so sometimes it's not that natural uh, for us. Um, and also, uh, as I mentioned, some of the preconditions for not using force uh, to Taiwan are also very vague. Uh, so if Taiwan, for example, is Taiwan, many people in Taiwan are doing things in the eyes of Beijing uh, to promoting uh, Taiwan independence or increasing the likelihood of Taiwan independence, um, then maybe Beijing will, th will think things are moving uh, to the hostile direction. But maybe, maybe from us, it's, uh, it's not that bad. For example, uh, between KMT and DPP, actually, to some extent, they share some common ground. 
they share this some they share the common ground that they both of them uh, recognize the legitimacy of uh, the government of ROC. Uh, if they strengthen this uh, common ground, would Beijing think that's a move toward to China, or or a de facto uh, a de facto independence? Uh, so I think a lot of these things are are very uh, subject to this Beijing subjective uh, interpretation, and. Uh, this leads to uh, my third question, that is the shadow, the shadow of the future. Uh, it is very nice that Mr. Lin uh, mentioned the possibility, although he didn't say that, but I, I think the implication is there, that the Third Republic, the possible future uh, that both sides can, uh, can create, a common future. But the, then the naturally it leads to the question that what kind of future is that? What kind of common China would that be uh, domestically and internationally? Uh, if we don't have a clear answer to that, <coughs> then uh, it will be very difficult to sell the idea that we shall have a common future if we don't know what kind of future that is. Uh, so the long-term goal actually has to do with the short-term interaction. Lastly, I think uh, there is some kind of dilemma that Beijing will have to face in the short run. Uh, for example, does Beijing see KMT as a proxy for promoting unification in Taiwan or not? If so, if, the, if Beijing does, then how does Beijing face the reality, uh, as I said, that the KMT share with DPP in the legitimacy of ROC. Does Beijing have an idea how to solve the problem of the status of ROC? Uh, if Beijing grants the legitimate governance entity status, as suggested by Professor Lin, to ROC, then when DPP came to power, comes to power, would Beijing still acknowledge that DPP has such an, a status? Um, and another thing is that recently we have seen signs from Beijing to push KMT to move toward political uh, dialogue on the cross-strait relations. But the dilemma is if Beijing pushes too hard, as I said, that they will increase KMT's problem in its domestic competition. But if Beijing does not push, then maybe uh, I mean, next administration, uh, the DPP will come in power. Then all the, all the efforts that Beijing have in this term will be in vain. So that is also a dilemma that I can think of for Beijing. But uh, to conclude my remark, I think uh, Professor Lin has presented a very interesting uh, paper. And both papers uh, are very stimulating uh, the, for us to think of uh, uh, possible uh, solutions as well as more questions for cross trade regions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Xu. Uh, Dr. Tong, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to read both papers in advance. I really benefit a lot and enjoy uh, to a great extent. Particularly, I would like to comment on Professor Goh's uh, paper first, because I cannot wait to express my personal uh, gratitude for his dedication and uh, contribution to the promoting and uh, uh, to bridging friendship between Taiwan and the United States. I think you have done a lot of job and did a lot of good to both sides for understanding, mutual understanding and mutual uh, benefit. So I really appreciate a lot. So instead of commenting on his paper, <laughs> I would like to raise two questions for you. So maybe I can benefit more from your uh, answers. You know, first, I when I read your paper, you mentioned that the so-called Taiwan familiarization program is a short-term program. So I'm wondering whether 
how can we uh, sustain a long-term program of foreign studies in Taiwan, or how to identify, uh, reinforce, and even create Taiwan's competitive advantage to attract more foreign students or even scholars to Taiwan. I think this is very important for Taiwan's survival in the long run. We can train more uh, people in Taiwan so that we can have more uh, international talents to default into Taiwan's in, uh, long-term development. Secondly, uh, currently Taiwan uh, National Central University have a, a bundle of programs uh, taught in English, including IDA, International Doctoral uh, Asia Pacific Studies. Uh, so we recruit a lot of foreign students in Taiwan, and uh, this program is completely taught in English. And currently, the National Central University is also initiating a new program, which will completely in English, and also uh, uh, taught in English, but it's a master program of international studies. So we will try to uh, integrate in university-wise talent resources and uh, try to attract more foreign students to Taiwan. So I would like to also seek your advice. What would be best for National Central University to initiate this kind of program in the future? And then regarding uh, Dr. Lenz's paper, I would like to make some comments. Uh, first, I read his paper with great uh, interest. Particularly, he mentioned two very important dimensions. Uh, several papers presented today have mentioned globalization, uh, including Professor Zhu Yin Han and including Professor uh, Dietmer, uh, regarding how this kind of dimension influence cost trade relations, relationships in the long run. And Dr. Lem also mentioned that democratization in Taiwan also transformed the nature of state society relationship in Taiwan. I agree indeed. These two dimensions, or these two major variables, really transform, change the nature of state uh, society relations in Taiwan. So that this kind of transformation also change the nature of development of state in Taiwan. Particularly, globalization and, and democratization reduce state's power and resources. And so that provide more power and resources to, for society, as well as local governments. So this paper pr provides a very clear and grand pictures or guidance to understand the current relationship between state and society. I think I learned a lot. And because of, of his uh, abundance of uh, uh, explanation, also stimulate my some questions for uh, Professor Lun. You know, first, this paper basically uh, focuses on business sector, both domestic and foreign sectors. But I'm wondering if Professor Lun can also elaborate on other sectors of society, you know, including the Joseph Yuan or Congress, media in Taiwan, public opinions, laborers, small, medium enterprises. As many, many policy making in Taiwan has been in entangled with all these sectors. And even we can also can only understand the business sectors interact with the state sectors, but other sectors we are also get into get involved into the process. In addition, I think this paper also uh, focuses on domestic agents and the resources, but not elaborating uh, the laws of international regime and foreign governments, including China. And let me give you one example. Uh, after 2000, both Taiwan and China. Uh, are joining, uh, were entering the WTO. So WTO required Taiwan to open it up for Chinese goods to enter into Taiwan, and also require Taiwan to change our regulation regarding bilateral changes. So maybe this kind of international regime also provide some explanation for the current relationship between Taiwan and China's economic exchanges. And furthermore, uh, I would like to say this paper uh, mostly limited to the materials up to mid-2008. I, I believe this paper has provided a very useful uh, resources and explanation. But this subject is quite complicated. So I believe uh, maybe in the future, uh, Professor Lun can do more empirical studies on the current policy regime or current relationship between Taiwan uh, and China uh, for the interaction between state and society regarding the development of state uh, dimension. 
Furthermore, I would like to mention that maybe some core assumptions adopted by Professor Lern in his paper maybe require more articulation or uh, analysis. In the such as two core assumptions. First one is dilemma between security and economic interest. Second is about complementary complementarities between opening cost trade economic policy and upgrading Taiwan's economic research and development. You know, sometimes security concern might be complicated, furthermore, might be perceptional. You know, for example, the same issue during the DPP administration could be regarded as security threatening, but the same dimension under the Ma administration could be considered as peaceful promoting. So this could be a very subjective to some degree. So maybe when you discuss this dimension, or we should discuss nature and also try to elaborate uh, furthermore the details. And when we see the current policy regime, you uh, I would like to suggest Professor Lern also try to explain how mind your administration reconcile all these dynamics and assess complementarities so that we can understand what's the differences between the DPP administration and the mind your administration. And in addition, I'm also curious why if we understand based upon Professor Lern's paper, then I am just curious why did Manchu administration continue to put ceiling and the restriction on the inflows of Chinese investment to Taiwan? In the last year, last June, uh, the Manchu administration opened up for Chinese investment into Taiwan, but at least the Manchu administration continued to put some ceilings and also try to open up in, into very limited uh, sectors for Chinese investment into Taiwan. And particularly, uh, recently the Manchu administration continued to restrict, restrict 12 inches waiver investment from investing in China by Taiwan business people. So if uh, the prerequisite is right, or the uh, assumption is right, that is opening of cultural relations, economic relations would promote Taiwan's research and development, will promote Taiwan's economic development, and even will promote uh, the developmental stay uh, dimension. Then why the Manchu administration continue to do such things? In addition, uh, during the election period, the Manchu, uh, Manchu and the, uh, Vincent Xiao, the vice president, advocate very strongly to establish the so-called cost trade common market. Uh, particularly, he mentioned that there will be a, a priority during his term uh, in his office. But now, after he assumed his position, he postponed this kind of proposition. So we are just want, I'm just wondering why, he, based upon uh, the developmental state logic, why the Manchu administration would postpone uh, this kind of proposition. And finally, uh, in, use, uh, in your paper, you also mentioned that uh, local governments and governance might play a very important role uh, in the decision making of cost trade economic policy, uh, decision making of developmental state. But nevertheless, probably in the future, uh, maybe you can uh, add more uh, observation or some insight on this aspect, which will enrich uh, our understanding uh, regarding uh, this issue. Uh, in your paper, you, you particularly described what is the security dimension, uh, dilemma. You mentioned that as Taiwan's economic development leans more on the Chinese market, then the Chinese military threat continues to impose pressures on Taiwan's security concern. And I think this is probably uh, the most clear definition of security dilemma in your paper. But nevertheless, I'm wondering if this kind of Demolition is also subjective, and particularly this, this demolition might not arise from close trade economic relations between Taiwan and China. Because no matter how close Taiwan's economic relations with Taiwan is, China's military power and spread pressure toward Taiwan might continue to increase given current circ circumstances and trend. So probably that dimension, that security dilemma is caused by other factors. So I, I just wonder if you can explain furthermore. In addition, you know, because I served in the government for a certain period of time, 
I also would like to uh, provide some uh, background for your understanding of the past administration uh, regarding uh, cost trade and operations. You know, uh, in the past eight years, between 2000 and 2008, actually the DB administration tried to build consensus into, uh, in two uh, meetings. The first one is uh, the, the Economic Development Advisory Conference in 2001. The second one is the, the Conference on Sustaining Taiwan's Economic Development in 2006. Then the DB administration adopted two different policy approach to address economic relations between Taiwan and China. The first period is called proactive liberalization with effective management. Then the second period was called proactive management with effective liberalization. Also, we just see some sw switch for the wording, but uh, there are some uh, uh, nuanced change uh, into the policy implementation. So for the first period, as a matter of fact, the DBB administration constantly open up for cost trade economic changes. For example, during the DBB administration, uh, the government implement the so-called ministry links, not in the KMT administration. The DBB administration liberalized uh, Chinese exports to Taiwan uh, in a very great extent. And also the DBB administration tried to liberalize Taiwan, Taiwanese investment to, ta uh, to China, liberalized Chinese investment in Taiwan, and also expanded uh, the offshore transshipping center uh, in both Keelong and Kaohsiung, and also allowed charter flights during Lunar New Year holidays. Although Mao Zedong administration established three trade links, but the, it, it was DB administration to initiate this kind of passenger charter flight. And also the DB administration uh, facilitated financial transaction between Taiwan and China, and also allowed Taiwan's financial institution to establish uh, representative office in China, allowed Taiwan to uh, open up Taiwan to Chinese tourists. We opened up for Category 3 and Category 2 <coughs> of Chinese tourists to visit Taiwan. And finally, uh, the DB administration also tried to re relax restriction on Chinese professionals entering Taiwan. So you can see that even during the first period of the DB administration, the DB administration continued to open up for cost trade exchanges, economic relations. So we can hardly divide it into a dichotomy, either opening or closing of cost trade economic relations. Then if we look at figures, you can see that the cost trade economic changes has been increasing, increasing very rapidly. Here is the number for ministry readings, and here is the uh, liberalized Chinese export to Taiwan. And you can see in 2000, we just only open up for almost 56% of Chinese products <coughs> into Taiwan. But by the end of 2006, we open up for almost 80% of Chinese products into Taiwan. And here is the number to, uh, here, here is the uh, descri description uh, for liberalized uh, Taiwanese investment into China. And we all also liberalized in three stage for Chinese investment into Taiwan. Here's the number for offshore transshipping center. And we also continue to facilitate uh, financial transaction. Allowed Taiwan's financial institution to uh, establish office in China. Now I would like to turn to my conclusion. Cost trade relations has been very complicated and many sectors, many actors would get involved in the decision marking in the government. So in 2005, Actually, in 2004, the DB administration proposed to negotiate with the Chinese government for 18 issues, including 16 issues in functional issues and two in political issues per se. But then the Chinese government continued to boycott for negotiation. So that is why, at the end, the opening of cost rate economic changes has been very limited, uh, at least from my understanding. So this is for your information. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tong.